Welcome to the Find Your Exit Podcast, where the leading authority on buying, selling, fixing, and growing companies, Michelle Seiler Tucker, is dedicated to helping you find the path to retire rich and move on to your next adventure by exiting your business for the desired dream price you deserve. Get ready to find your exit with your host, Michelle Seiler Tucker. <laughs> Welcome to Find Your Exit. I'm so excited to have my very good friend, Robert Ramey, on the show today. Robert Ramey is quite the entrepreneur who has owned six different businesses. He has sold one business through us. Yay. <laughs> and he owns a few businesses right now. So we're so excited, Robert, to have you on the show. We want to hear about the latest and greatest of what you're doing. So tell us a little bit about yourself and how did you become an entrepreneur? Great. Okay. Thank you. And first of all, Michelle, you know, you're one of my favorite people in the world and not just because you sold my business for more than it was worth, but uh, <laughs> you know, we stayed friends obviously. And then all the years have gone by and here we are, you know, trying to line up something else. Right. Uh, so Perfect. like, like Michelle said, I'm Robert Ramey. I live in new Orleans. My business is located in new Orleans. And even though right now we're all working from home, like I am right now, uh, you know, we continue to do things that can be expanded. And although we may have to change some of those things, uh, the online element of what we're doing is going really well. So um, having said that, I've owned personalized product companies. I own a magazine company, and we have since started a augmented reality company, a technology company uh, that we're very excited about. Great. So let's talk about let's talk about the company that you own that we sold. Kind of let's start there because that was one of your biggest companies, right? Sure. Yes. And that was a personalized. Um, we don't have to get into the, to the nuts and bolts of it and disclose any names or anything, but it was a personalized business where you had like 3000 distributors throughout the United States, if I remember correctly. Yes, exactly. Well, uh, Ted had uh, done uh, well in the consumer facing type products. We do services as well. Again, the magazine is an advertising vehicle. Uh, but that particular company was in the right place at the right time because it was a personalized product and anything personalized is always going to do well. Um, and at that time in the late nineties, when we started that, uh, and we decided to do the traditional advertise, wait for the feedback to come in, wait for leads to come in, follow up on the leads and then obtain distributors at that, at that time was home-based distributors. And it was exactly the right product at the right time. So, um, when we decided to sell that, of course, um, was what really wasn't in the plans to do that, but it just happened that you, you know, fell onto our lap and then, you know, the rest is history. So that's funny. So you never really planned to sell the business at that time. My company contacted you. So you thought, well, why not? Well, I think that any business owner thinks, you know, in the back of their mind, you know, that sooner or later they will sell it. I'm not sure the exit strategy is, is really just a target date as much as it is, you know, you know, you're going to do it. You know, you should know when the time is right. Uh, and the time is right. Usually not when it's broken and it needs to be fixed, which is what the mistake people make. They wait till it's going down. Uh, but when, when you feel that that time is right, when you're ready to move on to the next challenge, when it's peaked, when it's worth the most it can possibly be worth, you know, then you start exploring, at least exploring those options. And, um, and then if somebody is in the, in the right neighborhood that, that does that for a living like you did, uh, then you at least have to explore it. In our case, we, were, we just got lucky. Yeah, cause you, and I think you did get lucky, and, and obviously you have a great M&A advisor, but I think you did get lucky, and the reason for that is because eight out of 10 businesses do not sell. And when we sold your company, I think it was in 2006, the landscape has changed dramatically. Back then, it was typically um, 80 to 95% of businesses in business for the first five years would go out of business. Right. When I wrote Exit Rich in 2019, and I did that research over, that landscape has changed dramatically. I don't even know if you know this, but now it's not 85 to 95% of businesses go out of business. Now it's only 30% of businesses will go out of business in those first five years. And out of 27 million businesses, 70%, now listen to this, 70% of business owners will go out of business after being in business 10 years. 10 years. 70%, yeah, so yeah. it's changed dramatically. And, and, and that has a lot to do with Amazon and it has a lot to do with that, that business owners don't innovate. They stop innovating and they stop marketing. One of your core competencies, in my opinion, has always been innovating and marketing. You're really good at innovating. You're really good at finding out what the, what the market needs, what clients need, what their number one problem is, and then becoming a solutions expert. And you're great at marketing. 
Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. So a lot. So you, yes, you do get lucky because the biggest mistake the business owners make is they don't plan their their exit, and they don't think about selling until they have to because they're burned out or a catastrophic event has occurred, you know, internal or external like COVID or hurricane or something like that. We actually sold your business. I want to say right after Hurricane Katrina. I think it was 2006 or 2007, right? 2006, Katrina was a year. It took about a year yeah, to move through that process and go through yeah. the buyers and the, and the people falling off and, the, you know, couldn't so get the financing. Yeah. Tell the, tell the viewers a little bit because, you know, sellers have, sellers struggle with selling their business because it's their baby, right? They grew it up from nothing, from the incubator stage. Well, because you started it from the ground up. You didn't buy it. A lot right. of business owners will buy a business, but you started from the ground up and it really was your baby. I mean, you're the proud father of twins, beautiful twins who are very successful, <laughs> but that was your baby. So to walk our viewers through kind of the emotional um, roller coaster that sellers go through when they're selling their business and how you were able to move forward and actually close on the sale of your business. Sure. Well, just like any other possession or asset, you know, you put that much work into something and that much of your time and blood, sweat and tears and just to let that go, even for any price, uh, has a psychological effect. So I, I would think that you have to disconnect yourself from that and look at what's good for yourself, for your business, for your family, what's the smart business move to do, uh, and, and then move on from there. So in this case, it was the right time, and you have to kind of let those things go. If you have a good um, representative like you were, you know, you were able to hold my hand through that and, and deal with the anxiety and the second thoughts and the Monday morning quarterbacking and all that. And, uh, and then you had the buyers and the negotiations was a whole other level of uh, frustration. Um, and you had to kind of keep them calm. I know you've done that so many times, but uh, I'm sure you haven't met too many as crazy as I was. <laughs> no, believe it or not, you're pretty sane. I'm a lot crazier. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it is a roller, uh, it is an emotional roller coaster on the sell side because of seller's remorse, but it's also a, a emotional roller coaster on the buyer's side because of buyer's remorse. I'm sure on their side, they're wondering why do they want to sell their business? What's wrong with it? And they're always looking for that, you know, that red flag or that, you know, that shoe to drop where they're going to go, aha, that aha moment. Well, this is why he's selling it because of this, because of that. Um, so I'm sure it's the same, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, that's a good side. point that you just made because that's usually the buyer's number one question is if the business is so good, why are you selling? Right. So that's always the number one question. So that's why we always, we always want, I always say that when we put together the paper, the perspectives on sellers' businesses, we want to identify the good, the bad, and the ugly. And if there's anything in the closet, we want to get that out to right. the center so it's not a surprise later. Transparency. You didn't really have any ugly things. You didn't really have anything in the closet, so to speak. Your business was pretty good. Right. Yeah, they would always ask, you know, the question is, is the business only as good as the business owner? So you always got to get past that first, right? It can be right. replicated. Um, duplicated or you can have employees do whatever the owner was doing so yeah. we got that past that pretty fast and then it was just you know transparency after that the numbers didn't lie you know in the end it was, yeah. it was what we said it was and uh, they were willing to pay the fair price for that and what was great about I mean your business was a small business so it was a family business you and your your wife and you had some employees but with your business it was quite um, different than most businesses as where the buyer relocated your company to a whole nother state you know, and sometimes it yeah. happens, uh, but not very often, but they kept your general manager and actually relocated her to that. Yeah. Store. So that was. They didn't have to do that. I really remember. I really wanted to do that. I was kind of loyal. I didn't want to, the one buyer that we had that was, we were going to break the company apart and sell it in pieces, whatever, whatever they call those kind of buyers. And we didn't really want that. You know, we were going to see it kept intact. And uh, the, the business, the office director or the office manager was willing to relocate and, and was kind of a, uh, you know, a carbon copy of me at that point because I had trained her so well, she would make the decisions I would make. So they they made uh, the right decision by moving her. But having distributors in different uh, states didn't hurt that we didn't just have a, a business that was based in New Orleans with New Orleans clients that we had people, you know, all over the country and even in seven other countries. Yeah, and that was really crucial because you went through Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. I went through Hurricane Katrina and about 95% of my clients were underwater <laughs> You're one of my saving graces. <laughs> right. What was good about your company is you have 3,000 distributors across the country. And that's what I always tell my clients is you really need to diversify. 
You know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't just have clients in one state. Diversify and not only have clients in different locations, but also have additional revenue streams. Because if one revenue stream dies and you have other revenue streams, which you still do, because even at that time, you had other businesses and you still do, which is good. Yeah. Yeah, very well said. The, the, the different revenue streams in case one distribution channel uh, dries up or one product dries up. In my case, I always like to have juggling two companies at the same time. I just built that way. Um, but it's not for everybody, I can tell you that. But, you know, so maybe one at a time is a better approach. But, <laughs> but yeah, you're certainly right about not putting all your eggs in one basket or even one market if you have a business that can do that. Yeah, and I think I don't think so much to have multiple companies like I do or you do because I have multiple companies. But I think if you have a company that have <clears throat> multiple congruent revenue streams that are congruent, you know, that way if one product dies, then you have another product that you can take advantage of. Right. And that's the big, <clears throat> biggest mistake that owners make is they don't, they don't innovate and they don't market. Exactly. A perfect example, my magazine company, we, we switched to a digital um, bundled approach years ago where we have, a, you know, obviously a website and um, we have enough impressions there we can charge for people to be have banners and banner and advertising on our website and then we have an app for the magazine which is localized and then we have the social media side and we have the email marketing side we have maybe six or seven thousand emails in each market so right. or maybe more so having those revenue streams at a time like this when we couldn't print for a couple months uh, and we're just now going back to printing even a partial printing if we hadn't had that digital side to fall back on then we had no, no, you know, the rate car would have been dead. So we were able to fall back on that right. and keep our advertisers calm and let them know that we're going to, we're going to communicate your reopening plan. We're going to keep your name out there. We're going to help you through that process. And the same thing with the community. We were able to mail some magazines and do some different things creatively with the print side and also use that print to get people to the digital side. So you had to pivot really quickly. <laughs> yes. literally. <laughs> Still pivot every day. <laughs> How many revenue? You know, I call I call it the six P's. So Exit Rich, my book that's coming out, is all about the six P's. Uh, and so the six P's are, I'll tell you real quick, are people. Do you have enough people in your business? Do you have the right people? Do you have a management team? Product, is your product thriving or is your product dying? Right. Processes, are your process efficient, productive, are they well documented? Is everybody trained on it? Does it make you money or is it losing you money? And then proprietary is number four. You know, are you well branded? Like the Coca-Cola brand alone is worth $79 billion. That's just a brand. That's not assets, inventory, real estate, or anything else. And then do you have patents in place? Do you have contracts that are transferable? Do you have databases? And then the fifth P is patrons, and then the sixth P is profits. Well, my seventh P is pivot. Because <laughs> right now, pivot. everybody has to pivot. Yeah. Right. Right. We're all pivoting. We're all pivoting. <laughs> That's right. So you just named a bunch of revenue streams. How many revenue streams do you have? Yeah, uh, well, pretty much the ones I mentioned, but we kind of bundled it in. We do have a la carte stuff, but if somebody buys a print ad, they pretty much get some exposure in those other uh, distribution channels. But um, but they, but we certainly have customers who only pay for the digital side, and we've been doing that transition for a while, uh, knowing that the print you know has gone down some. Everybody's got a computer in their pocket, has for many years now. So uh, the, the the print models that did not do that, you know, we know what happened to those. And it's not, a, not an easy thing to do to get somebody from print to the digital side and uh, train, even help them uh, learn how important that is, even on the social media, where they don't really need us as much as they used yeah. to. It'll help with that. Cool. Great. So in your company, in the sale of your business, we bought you several buyers, lots of buyers, but I think we bought you two offers. Do you remember that? Well, at the end, yes. Well, we bought you more than two offers. Right. At the end, we bought you two offers. One was with another broker out of state, and then one was with me. Do you remember that? Yeah. Two qualified <laughs> buyers. Yeah, I remember. Two qualified yeah. buyers, yeah. And what did I tell you? Yeah, uh, go, go with the one you're most comfortable with. Yeah. Not the one that will make the most of them, but the one you're most comfortable with. Right. Whatever you feel the most comfortable with. That's right. And uh, I think we even walked away from the first offer. Uh, and, 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 and when you said that, that meant a lot, actually, because I did, it was such an emotional attachment. I didn't want to let it go to just anybody. Uh, and, and you, of course, you stood to lose a big commission if we didn't make that sale. And when I decided not to pull that trigger on that day with that buyer, uh, I mean, you didn't flinch. You were there. You were supporting me. We're going to get through it. We're going to go to the next guy. We're going to find a new buyer. If you're not comfortable with this one, walk away right now. And uh, I really respected that. Thank you. Yeah, because I mean, at the end, it's not just about selling a business and making a commission. It's about making the right fit 
because the most important thing to a seller, obviously they want to cash out. They like to exit rich. <laughs> they like to sell a business for more than it's worth. But most importantly, yeah. they want to leave their legacy. They want to transfer their legacy in good hands. They right. want to make sure their customers are taken care of. They want to make sure that their employees are taken care of. And they want to make sure that their legacy continues to grow. Right. And for you, I mean, understanding like any business owner that, you know, we're, custom, we're customers not one time, but for a lifetime. Yeah. So you're selling a business for somebody who's probably going to start another business and sell it down the road. And, and here we are, right? All these years later, we're still talking yeah, because about you're a serial entrepreneur. You know, there's entrepreneurs and there's serial entrepreneurs. And a lot yeah. of, you know, people ask me, well, Michelle, why do businesses sell? Why do, why do owners want to sell? Well, number one is retirement. You know, there's 30.2 million businesses out there. 99% yeah. of them are small business owners. Number one is retirement. But then you have creators like you who want to go out and create their next masterpiece. They want to do something <laughs> different because they get that seven year itch. How long yeah. did you, you mean like art? You mean like artwork? Yeah, like artwork. And we're gonna we're gonna slide right into that. <laughs> so that's a great segue. So so why don't we do that now? Why don't we talk about what's next for Robert Ramey and what you're working on now and the future, your future. Sure. Well, like you said, you know, the entrepreneur always always wants to create something new. And you, know, you can't be willing to, uh, unwilling to take a risk, even if it's a small risk. Uh, and the brand building, I really do love that part as much as it uh, can be infuriating to, you know, to be thinking about the next thing before you finish the first thing. You, know, you always got to uh, be willing to take those risks and, uh, and go with your heart and go with the things you believe in and follow your dream and all those things that we would recommend to anybody that was thinking of starting their own business. Um, but understanding that the, you know, the failures are going to come and there's nothing easy about it and the challenges and the adversity is there and you got to be willing to put the fires out. And I have a thing where actually I'm going to put out all my fires by noon and the afternoon is reserved for profit. That's my thing is I'm going to put all the fires by noon and then the afternoons for fun, for profit, for creating. I love that. That is a great, great, great tip. Yeah, I was going to ask you what's what's your number one tip, and not now. I don't even have to ask you. You got it. Question. <laughs> fabulous tip because that is so true. Because the problem is, I call most entrepreneurs firefighters because they're yep. putting out fires all day long. But that is a great tip: put out all your fires before noon, and then focus on creativity afterwards. I right. love that. How Thank long you. have you been doing that? Yeah, forever. Oh, and I'm just now learning this. <laughs> Well, some days you wake up and there's more fires than you want. <laughs> so sometimes it takes past noon and then you get the ones that come up in the afternoon. But, you know, that's the whole thing. You just got to understand that that's going to happen and you're going to have challenges. And that's just the nature of owning a business. You're not punching in, you're punching out, you're not punching out. You're 24-7 and you have to be that type of person. Uh, but the, the benefits and, the, and the, uh, the payoff is so good, you know, because you get to set your own hours and, and uh, feel good about having achieved that, you know. Yeah. I agree. And I see this beautiful piece of artwork sitting behind you that actually is hanging up in my house. <laughs> you do have one. from you at an art gallery. <laughs> yeah. So why don't you tell us about this business real quick? Well, uh, the magazine business, as I said, we sold the other company, the personalized product company with you. Uh, and then it was about shoring up the magazine and spending time uh, rebranding that and creating all the digital uh, assets for the magazine company that would keep that um, flourishing into the, hopefully you know, the next 10 years until we sell that. Uh, but then, as I said, I don't like just having one company. So we started Scanscapes Technologies uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, the, the primary technology is augmented reality. So when we look at what's up and coming, what the next evolution of uh, tech's gonna be, and uh, what we're all, all the consumers and businesses are gonna be using as years go by, as years forward. Uh, this is the technology we decided upon. Uh, you have virtual reality. You understand virtual reality is where you wear the headset and you bump into the furniture and it's really cool and you're completely immersed in a 3D world. And it's uh, very important right now, actually, and it's doing uh, extremely well. All the headsets, the HTCs and the Oculus and all those companies you hear about are just selling out headsets like crazy. So VR is very, very prominent, very doing well, not just in gaming, and it's not going anywhere, especially in today's climate where you have to be home. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but augmented reality is where you can actually place digital things in the real world and you don't have to have a headset on um, and you can use your device to actually scan things in your real world and see things on top of the, the real environment. So mm -hmm. that's the technology. Everybody's heard of po Pokemon Go, but mm -hmm. you've also seen it in other places. You just don't really know it. It's in, so it's an up and coming technology that we got involved in. And so Scanscapes, uh, we have a products division and a services division. The first product of Scanscapes was Artscapes, and that's what you see here. 
-hmm. And this is what worked. It comes alive when using um, our app on, on your device. Wonderful. So maybe in a minute you can give a demonstration. So yeah. what is your, so how is this working? Like what, where are you selling it? Is it primarily in galleries? Tell me the usage of it. Yeah, so the distribution plan for this is direct sales. The revenue streams would be direct sales of the art. So we sell the art directly uh, online and we ship that all over the world. And it's canvas art and uh, art prints like this one right here, which is uh, uh, a, a um, matted product. So we ship those all over the world. We sell those by advertising online. So that's the direct sales. We also sell through galleries. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, they, they're considered partners of mm -hmm. ours. Those are retail partners, and then we have home-based partners, kind of similar to what we did in the personalized product company. Mm -hmm. We have a home-based uh, partner division, uh, and then we have an affiliate uh, division, which is you know kind of uh, caught on with Amazon and mm -hmm. people, affiliates, network uh, marketers that just sit home or wherever they are, and all they do is promote other products and companies with affiliate links, and they make 10, 20, 30% just by sharing that link mm -hmm. on their website or their, whatever their channel is. So you have four or five revenue streams for this consumer facing product. Um, and that's the augmented uh, reality side of, of the art world. So it's kind of where art's heading in our opinion. You know, the art, you see Van Gogh back there mm -hmm. and he actually comes alive actually uh, as well with our app. So who creates the art? Yeah, so we have, we license art out from artists all around the world. We deal with some local artists as well. Uh, and then it takes maybe five or six other people that are also artists and programmers and augmented reality people and app people to make each one of these animations work. So it's 2D animation, 3D, go ahead. Are they creating that art for you, for your company? Yes, usually. Wonderful. Sometimes we're licensing artwork that they already have. Mm -hmm. So it's a variety of different relationships we have there. So how many different pieces of artwork do you have right now? We have 300, but wow. only, only 25 of those are actually created. Okay. So like, it takes it takes an army uh, and a lot of work to, to animate each one of these. Uh, as I said, maybe maybe seven people worked on this this one right here. It took two months to make it. Wow. So it starts with good art. It has to be good art. It looks great on your wall, like the one you have. Mm -hmm. uh, and then from there, they're able to scan that art and bring that new life out of it, that new experience. Of one to two. Yeah, minutes. it's a great conversational piece at parties. Yeah. You know. And over time, we add experiences. So you buy it once, but you, but it lives forever. So we'll add a new experience. And later on, we'll add another experience. So you might have, you know, two or three or four different experiences for the same painting. Oh, I did not know that. So my yeah. painting right there that's hanging in my house, you're mm -hmm. going to have multiple experiences for that? Yes, absolutely. Oh, wow. At some know, point, okay. How about uh, that at an art gallery with you? <laughs> at some point, you'll be able to interact with that art with your finger. You'll be able to change the art yourself, personalize it even. So there's things coming with this technology that uh, are, aren't even possible yet. Eventually, it'll be in our glasses. The Apple will be coming out with a set of, uh, a headset that looks very similar to the glasses you have on now that will do the same thing that your device does. Wow, so which will that's be in the better than That's in the future. Than, yeah, that's even better than holding up the device though, right? Yeah, well, ultimately you'd want to just have it on, on your face, right? Yeah, and the app is free, is that yeah, correct? It's called Artscapes, it is a free app. It's a free app, so, so the revenue comes off of buying the art for you. Right, that's okay. exactly right. On this so particular how, product. How can this be expanded for you, and mm -hmm. I don't want to give out any trade secrets, but how, <laughs> yes. can this, how can this become bigger for you in addition to the art and the multiple experiences because you're getting paid, you got one revenue stream off the art, is that correct? Sure, but we've been hired by different companies to do different things so we can create an art experience where somebody can walk through a gallery and scan different things on the wall and see different animations and just information about the artist or videos so there's different services that we've done for different types of businesses that are art-related. Okay. Uh, they, they go beyond just us, direct sales to consumers type thing or through um, our partners. There's other things we can do on the services side that we've done, um, not only with art. We've done uh, sporting events. We've done music festivals. We've done scavenger hunts. We've made things pop up in front of stages on music festivals. Wow. So, um, yeah, album covers, uh, magazine covers, obviously. What about uh, so, Exit Rich? What can you do with my book? Yeah, we can do a lot with that book, actually. <laughs> they scan the cover of your book, and a, bit, a nice video of you comes up that, that does an intro to the book. Wow. So what can you – so for the listeners and myself who doesn't know a whole lot about this, you know, what can you make pop up like at a football game or at a concert or something like that? Give us a little bit more insight to that. 
Well, so interesting. augmented reality is already out there. It's already in the sports world. The NFL spent, you know, probably millions of dollars doing uh, an experience where you can see things in the stadium, uh, where mm -hmm. it's headed now, where you can uh, take the app and scan it over the field and the stats of the players would come up hanging over the field like a scoreboard almost would yep. in augmented reality. So it's not really there, but on your phone, it looks like it is, right? And see the last play. You can see the stats of the, what's happening in the game real time. Uh, geolocating things in the stadium like we did at the baseball tournament. We did a baseball tournament where we could actually place things on the ground. They could scan it. It was a scavenger hunt. We had arrows pointing down to different things all hanging in the air, but in the, on the digital side, on your device. Yeah. So it also, yeah. uh, we can digitally map stadiums and digitally map locations so you have an experience going in. Yeah. And, and so the person who wants to map that out, I mean, they could use this for an advertising campaign and all different kinds of promotional products and things like that, right? Could be, right? sure. Yeah? Sure. So what about, so what about like if I look in, what about if I see something on TV and I go, oh, I like her outfit. <laughs> yeah. Is there any, what's the augmented reality for that right now? Because I think that's yeah. up and coming, right? They absolutely have apps out, out there that you can try things on first before you buy. Amazon has augmented reality already in it. Google's embraced that. You can certainly try on sunglasses. You can put a tattoo on your arm with augmented reality. Wow. Uh, there's all sorts of companies doing very creative uh, and innovative things with augmented reality. And so what other sectors to, are you going to expand into? Other than well, we're going to be launching some gift products. We're going to be actually launching a line of face masks soon that are art related. I don't have one in front of me that are art related, but also that they are activated in Snapchat and uh, Instagram, which is extremely popular. Uh, the number one uh, revenue producer in the augmented reality is actually Snapchat. Really? And, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in ad revenue as it relates to augmented reality already. So can you create face masks for me for Exit Rich? Sure, sure. Oh, you wanted to see Exit Rich on it? Why not? Oh, why not? <laughs> I don't we, know. Look, you can look, come up with something creative for we're me. We're only limited by so, the, the imagination, the time, the skill, and the budget. That's it. We've done all sorts of things for people who've asked questions. They say, well, I'm sure this is a stupid question. I'm sure you can't make my wedding come alive or my wedding invitation birds fly out of it. And say, absolutely, we can do it. We've done some amazing you things. You can. You can make birds fly out of a wedding invitation? And we've had walls come up on a Greek city on the outside of a Greek invitation and birds and, flower, and, and flowers falling down on the invitation. And the girls wow. came up. Yeah. All right. I need to talk to you about my daughter's birthday coming up soon. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, we can, do, we can do her invitation. We'll make her a princess. All right, great. Well, she is a princess. <laughs> <laughs> so that's wonderful. So how big is your team? I know you're the creative genius behind mm -hmm. the business, but how big is your team? Yeah, well, that's the good thing is that all you have to do is get people that are smarter than you. And exactly, which have is a lot what I've always said. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a lot of very smart people on the team around the world. We probably have 30 or 40 people uh, working, you know, on and off around the world in places as far as way as uh, Israel, Egypt, um, yeah. India, obviously, um, Ukraine, you know, we have people all over the place. We have local people, obviously have staff here, uh, but you know, 30 or 40 people at any given time, you know, maybe working on various projects. Wonderful. So what's your exit? My, what's my exit? <laughs> what's your exit? With Tyler Tucker, with me, what's your exit? What's your exit? You know, I would say, I would, you mean timeline? Yeah. Oh, um, you know, I'm always chopping. Now, <laughs> <in the highest bidder. laughs> a good time to get out. <laughs> no. we're, we're, we're absolutely excited about, you know, building these new brands up because our skips is just the beginning. We have other brands coming. Uh, so, you know, the five to seven years is usually, you know, something I look at when I probably get, you know, yeah. it gets well oiled and I get bored with it. Right. Right. And, so, and then it'll probably peak out about that time. I always say, I always think, you know, like I said before, there's your entrepreneurs that will grow a business and hold on to it for decades, right? Yeah. And then they either try to pass it on to their children, and nowadays the children don't want their parents' business anymore like they used to. Right. So they'll either pass it on to their children or sell it. But then there's people like you and me who are true serial entrepreneurs who like to build a masterpiece, sell it, and build our next masterpiece. How yeah. many more masterpieces do you have in you? Oh boy, <laughs> you know, you, you, you always want that, you know, you can always do one better, right? You always want to get, you know. You're as good as your last one. one. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm kind of one of those, I probably wouldn't know what to do with myself, you know, when you retire, you expire kind of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's what Donald Trump I says. To I believe to it. Retire I is expire. It. Yeah. <laughs> 
So what motivates you? Uh, what motivates me now? Yeah. It's, just, it's just to achieve things, to, to, to help, the, you know, do things that help. You know, with the face mask company, we're going to be giving masks away. We want to make the, the wearing a face mask, even though it may be short term, may not be short term. We don't know yet, right? That's hopefully uh, short term. <laughs> we want to make that uh, accept, socially acceptable and fun and entertaining and engaging um, because we think that would help if, if more people would wear a mask. Right now, it would probably help. This is my right. opinion, but I would, we're going to try that out for a while and we're going to give some masks away. But you always want to do something that, that could help. Right. Yeah, I, I say that too. You know, I'm starting a nonprofit called Taco Teens and Tots. And uh, the basis of it is to provide entrepreneurial skill sets, mentorships, yeah. um, job placement, partnership placement, even, even um, business ownership. Because the more successful you are, the more you can give back. That's and exactly the more right. you can give back money and time, right? And so I'm starting that nonprofit. So a percentage of all transactions that Sadler Topper does We'll go to Tucker Teams and talk. So I really think that that everyone should give back. Everybody should give back to their community and 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 either start a nonprofit or give back to a nonprofit that you're that you're in love with. You know that that you feel is a great nonprofit. Like I do a lot of things with Frank Shankwitz, who is the founder of Make a Wish Foundation. He's going to be on Find Your Exit soon as well. I don't know if you saw his movie Wish Man, but you should go watch that. No, I didn't, but I will. No. Is it Netflix or where is it? It's on Netflix. <laughs> wow, how do I know that? So, Robert, what were you like as a little boy? Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, so, yeah, I was. I would say I was uh, one of those inquisitive kids, you know, would be, and I asked my mom, so, you know, what, how was I as a kid? Was well behaved? So, no, you would always go to people's houses and you would just go take the pots and pans out of the, out of the cabinets and throw them everywhere. And then I would be, once they picked that up, I would be somewhere taking apart the doorknob. <laughs> um, or trying to take apart the TV. So, you know, it was always the next thing that in quiz. So how does that work? How does it work? How does my, how does that work? So well, kind of like Steve Wozniak, because that's what he used to do. Steve Wozniak, founder of Apple. <laughs> yeah, he but he's smart. Like that. Huh? He's smart. I'm just curious. You're smart too. Don't you ever discredit yourself. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very curious about things. So I would say just a bundles of energy, you know, uh, and then, you know, probably at 16 or 17, you know, it's when I probably knew I would be, you know, a business owner because I, I the ball, the one job I did have, the boss asked me to wear his uniform and, uh, and I sarcastically asked him if I got paid extra for advertising. So I, <laughs> I might have lasted maybe one or two days after that and I got fired. Um, so I think it was at that point I, I knew that I had to find a way to feed myself and I couldn't work for somebody else. So I had to go find something to do. So I started my first company at 18 and, and then, you know, just never, never really looked back. Yeah, that's wonderful. You know, I hear a lot of entrepreneurs tell me that they got fired over and over and over again. So if they were going to eat, they had to proud of it. <laughs> Yeah, and that was me too, actually. I don't like kids do that, but you know, <laughs> no, they know. <laughs> they know me. So, great. What else would you like to share with our viewers? Well, I would like to say that, uh, you know, I respect you and I appreciate you for all you've done for me over the years as a friend. And you, you did a wonderful job of selling my company. And, you know, I wouldn't be here if you didn't. And I would absolutely use you again. And we will do something together. I don't know what that is. I'm sure it'll be sell the next company, right, when this one's ready. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's, that's pretty much all. You know, I'm here. We're here. We're trying to innovate. We're trying to make new things with Artscapes. If somebody wants to go to artscapes.co, not .com, artscapes.co, they'll see the line of artwork there. Uh, if they want to go to scanscapes.com, our contact information is there. We can do anything. Uh, with augmented reality that your business might need. Uh, again, there's no limit to the things we can do, the exhibits we can do, uh, the ways we can help companies innovate. So can you do a quick demonstration for our viewers? Well, I'll try it out. Let's we talked try it about out. This. So the app, I'll X out and go. The app looks like this, So that's Artscapes, and you'll see scan there and places, and this is part of where you can go view different uh, events that we've done and different places of business that carry our products. Eventually, you'll be able to tour museums and galleries right there. So then we go to scan. This is where you would scan the printed piece, in this case, this artwork. And I'll turn the sound on. And if you can see that. So you'll see the butterfly start to move there. Print more this way. That way? Yeah, perfect. So you can go all around it. I can't really do it on here. Just 
they're in 3D, so if you go up under it, above it. Wow. Can you see that? I see it, absolutely. And so, if I can see it, our viewers can see it. There you go. Wonderful. So people find you at artscape.com? Yes, ma'am. All right. Artscapes.co. Artscapes.co. Artscapes okay. Dot, Thank you for correcting uh, me. Dot co. Right. Dot co. Well, thank you, Robert. And Robert. thank you to all of our viewers. This has been, thank you for joining us on Find Your Exit. And thank you so much, Robert Ramey, for joining us. Again, if you want to find Robert Ramey, go to artscape.co. Artscape.co. Artscape. And you can, you can go find us at Find Your Exit. Did I say it wrong? Artscapes.co. 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 So Artscapes.co. <laughs> Artscapes and you can find out more about Robert Ramey. You can see a, a picture of Robert, <laughs> his bio, <laughs> and more information of, of what Robert does and, and how you can work with Robert. And you can go to findyourexit.org. Findyourexit.org. So it was wonderful having you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you for Good joining you. me. And all right. Thank you for all your words of wisdom. All right. See you soon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Find Your Exit podcast. Don't forget to check out Michelle Seiler Tucker's Build to Sell Blueprint books and Exit Rich, along with more blogs, videos, and resources at findyourexit.org. Be sure to connect with Michelle on Facebook or LinkedIn and stay tuned for her next episode by subscribing in your favorite podcast player.